Have you noticed that politicians struggle to enact the things they run on? That regardless of who wins elections, lawmakers find that they cannot pass whatever legislation they like. They find, they find themselves bound by what is popular, or at least their sense of it. They can only act with a narrow set of ideas, and that range is called the Overton Window. And on the Overton Window podcast, we look at issues around the country and talk to people who change what is politically possible. Lenore Skenazy is, or has been, trying to get parents to help their kids learn to be independent, but she ran into a snag. It turned out that what people that people would increasingly begin calling the police and child services if they see kids around without an adult. Some of the parents run into real problems because the law is not on the side of the lessons parents are trying to teach. In addition to speaking on the importance of kids figuring things out for themselves, she's also working on a series of laws to better let kids explore and play by themselves without triggering state sanctions. Lenore is the author of Free Range Kids, and leads the Let Grow Project. Lenore, welcome. Well, thank you, Jarrett. Um, toast to you. Thank you. So, Lenore, why don't I'm opening that Overton window. How why are you the world's worst mom? Or... Well, I actually started out as America's worst mom, so I just got bumped up. But um, when our younger son was nine years old, I start, he wanted to take the subway by himself. And long story short, uh, we let him. My husband has never called you know, the world's worst dad, but it was a, a joint decision on our part. We thought that we're on the subways all the time. We don't live on the subways, but we're on them all the time. And uh, he's, our son speaks the language. He can read a map. He can talk to somebody if he needed help. And so he wanted to do it, and we decided, okay. So one sunny Sunday, I took him to a fancy department store, Bloomingdale's, left him there, and off he went on his adventure. He took the subway down. He took a bus across town. He came into our apartment beaming, you know, so proud that he had done something grown up that we had. Skills. Yeah, life skills, really, especially in New York. If you're not riding the subway, you're, you're not going anywhere. And uh, and I wrote a column about it. And uh, that column blew up. That was your mistake. So <laughs> I learned I have four kids, um, 10 and under. Whoa. And uh, I learned this lesson of the mommy blogs or what my mom, my wife calls the mommy blogs. Which yeah. is if you share anything <laughs> it's like chums. You put it out there and people she, she, love it. There's people that hate it. Right. People love sharing their opinion. So what? What? This was in 2008 because my son is 25 now. So long time ago. But after, you know, being on all these shows and getting that nickname, I started a blog called Free Range Kids. And I said, uh, you know, it's not that I don't want my son to survive. I love safety. I love my son. I love my older son who didn't take the subway by himself at age nine. Um, and it's just strange to me that the freedom that I grew up with, uh, that nobody gave a second thought to, uh, and I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. So I was, you know, riding my bike to the library and walking to school at age five and um, being outside with my friends. And it wasn't even that exciting, but it was childhood. There was some time that I was not under direct adult supervision or surveillance. And somehow that had evaporated. And we're talking the Overton window. The Overton window went from this much freedom for kids to this much freedom for kids. And in that space came um, this calling of 911 if you do see a kid outside. And um, I didn't realize that when I had let my son ride the subway, but I started hearing from parents saying, look, I love the idea of free range kids, but I'm worried that you know, somebody's going to call Child Protective Services on me. So that's when I realized, oh, well, I guess we have to make sure that the laws protect the parents who trust their kids with some independence. And I, can I just say one other thing? Yeah. It's, it's not just parents who want their kids to free range like me. It's also like a single mom working two shifts, and she knows that her seven, eight, or nine-year-old is okay coming home and, you know, doing their homework and eating some snacks and, you know, thumbing through TikTok for, for a few hours. That shouldn't be illegal either. That's not neglect. That's just making do without a lot of extra money. So one of the, the concept of the Overton window is that societal change has to happen before legislative change happens. And that's seems to me what's happened here, which is society's gotten kind of more stringent. The law has followed that by kind of increasingly cracking down on, on parents uh, doing kind of these activities. But that point on how quickly this has changed. Mm -hmm. And and from my standpoint, um, where you have these parents that were like you, that on the one hand understood, well, when I grew up, I mm -hmm. 
did bike down to the library or I did ride have the train. Have you ever seen Stranger Things? <laughs> yeah, Stranger right, right, exactly. And they have this nostalgia for it, but on the other hand, they don't do that for their own children. Right. And and I leave from my standpoint, some of the best memories of a kid were something happening where you had to deal with it on your own or mom didn't know about this, dad didn't mm-hmm. know about this. Um, why you do you never told them? <laughs> and you, yeah, yeah, they're finding out now. Oh, I'm right, on that. Right. Um, so why why do you think that changed? Why did these people become? Everyone's become parents for thousands of years. Last I checked. Yeah. Why is this generation the one that's really begun cracking down and kind of um, imposing a lot of these helicopter parenting on their kids? Do you think? Right. So first of all, let's just say that helicopter parenting is something imposed on the parents because I don't think parents yeah. individually all became you know, paranoid. Obviously, if everybody is driving their kids to soccer and walking their kids to school these days, a new normal has arisen. And, uh, you know, I did it. I walked my kids to school, too. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking, I don't, I remember not thinking, why am I doing this? My mom never did this for me because it was just the norm. You go with the flow. Um, so, so I wrote the book, Free Range Kids, and I outlined what I think are four reasons that we became so much more nervous for our children and not allowing them any freedom. Um, But I think there's a fifth that's bigger, and I'll tell you that too. But one is the media. The media is so much more intense than when my parents were raising me. I mean, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and then came cable. There's no internet. There was no internet. There was no cable when I was Mm -hmm. little. And so there wasn't even a concept of the 24-hour news cycle Mm -hmm. because news had a, a contained time at night. And it wasn't as granular. And then I read a neat article recently about um, Philadelphia was where uh, they birthed the concept of action news. And it always had to do with a reporter running out to some crime, big or small, and breathlessly reporting it. And then action news was fought by another station also in Philadelphia that came up with like eyewitness news. Mm -hmm. And it was an escalation of like, wow, this is cheap and easy and exciting. Let's just never put crime in context and make it seem as if it's mayhem out there every day. And of course, that was a very popular concept that spread. And, and um, I guess it was opening or closing the Overton window of what we thought was normal, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, we're living in the hell times. And, and well, fact, by definition, news is something abnormal. Yes, thank you. But you're you. thinking it's normal by people. Because it's on so much. There's something called the the mean world concept, which is you watch TV or on the internet and you see something scary and it makes you too scared to go outside. So you stay inside and you watch TV mm. and then you keep getting more scared. And it really skews your impression of the world. So so the media is, of course, to blame. We live in a litigious society, and we start thinking like lawyers, is that safe enough? Could somebody blame me? Is like, Should I even allow that? I, I, somebody once wrote to me that their neighbor had a trampoline and was making all the other parents sign waivers if their kid wanted to jump on it. And you think, well, that's crazy, and that's sane. <laughs> that, that happened to me as a kid. We well, yeah. had people on the, on the block that had a trampoline, but if you wanted to go on it, you had to sign a waiver in order to, to go on the family's oh. trampoline. They signed it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And did you, sir? I guess you survived. I, I okay. made it so far. So yeah. Far so good. And you're not trampolining. If I went on that trampoline now, yeah, I, that might be trouble. I certainly wouldn't jump with you. Um, we live in a culture filled with experts. Experts are always telling you you're doing it wrong. You can find a million. I mean, it's almost Halloween now, right? There will be thousands of articles telling you stuff that you don't have to do that you think you do. Check your child's candy for, mm-hmm. for poison. It's like how many children have been poisoned by a stranger's candy? Right. No. I think it's zero. It is yeah. zero. It's zero. Yeah. But I think and, I read that from you. Too. Well, yeah. It's so. a, it, And the poor guy who actually discovered this, who did the research, a guy named Joel Best, who's a sociologist, um, who went back in to the, to the 50s looking at newspaper accounts a few days out from Halloween to see if anybody had been poisoned. Nobody. Um, but he says, I've given up trying to convince people because I've, I've been reporting that same story for 35 years now. Mm-hmm. And every year I start getting the calls around October 1st. So it's really hard to um, disengage an urban myth once it's gotten its teeth into us. And then we have a, a, a culture of um, products and, you know, yay capitalism. But capitalism knows that the easiest dollar to d- extract from anyone is the dollar from uh, the, the wallet of a, of a nervous parent who thinks something will save their children, either from kidnapping and, you know, horrible fates that way or from not getting into a good college. Mm-hmm. Either way, you're always going to be game to pay for things. And so that the market has 
amped up our fears in an attempt to sell us more stuff. Spoons that change color if they're if the food on them is too hot. And then the thing I really didn't get to as much in my book um, as I think deserves. It's the idea that um, we are in control. There's the idea that um, you know right now there are so many apps and devices that tell you your kids' grades. They tell you your kids' behavior at school. They tell you, of course, where your kid is at any second. And now, um, have you seen those gizmo watches yeah. that you can put on kids? Did you know that- I have young kids. I see them on lots of kids, yes. Okay. Do you know what they do, aside from GPS the kid and also allow them to, to call mm-hmm. you? They can listen in hmm. anytime, not when you're on a call. You can just, it's, it's a bugging device hmm. for your child. And so- um, these are supposed to provide you peace of mind, but actually I think they've done the opposite for parents. They've sort of um, convinced us that any time we're not actively surveilling our kids, listening, reading their texts, um, talking uh, you know, with anybody else who is with them, um, enrolling them in an adult-run activity rather than giving them free time to run around, um, any time you're not doing that, your child is in horrible danger, and if anything bad happens to them, which we've already seen is an inflated idea, it's all your fault. So add those all together, and it starts feeling like anybody who is not either actively with their kid or putting their kid in an adult-organized activity or surveilling them with an electronic device is neglectful because what if something terrible happens? Yeah, when, it, when I talk to other, other parents on this, and me and my wife, to, to a large extent, practice kind of the concept you talk about. We, uh, you know, I don't think there's a book I've given away more than yours or told people to get. Uh, it's definitely, I suggest you do that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Free range kids. You can find it online. Um, and, uh, I was talking to a friend who's doesn't practice that philosophy and I was trying to explain this to him and, and I guess got to the point where I was like, look, I mean, we, we all know we can't protect our kids from, from everything. And they're one of the things that I try to practice. And we talk about me and my wife is you kids are going to make mistakes we want them to make mistakes. We want them to go through hardship because not horrible hardship, not horrible not hardship, or not famine. But things we know they're all going to go through anyways. Um, kids are going to deal with uh, where they are in a situation, and their friends want them to do something. They don't know if it's right or wrong, and maybe they end up doing it. But you want them to do that kind of where you do have control and can talk to them about it, um, and and even a little bit, you know, I guess I guess of trouble or potential harm. Because that's going to happen anyways, and and increasingly, um, I know I've read that the number of kids who have jobs while at okay. high school has plummeted. The number of kids who do any type, even chores or any type of work, yeah. um, has declined because the parents are trying to protect them, and homework's kind of their job, and they need to focus on it. But then they get to college, and they are confronted where that's their exposure to other kids drinking alcohol. You might be surprised to hear kids drink alcohol in college, or or, or they have this, this when. Yeah, I know. Or this stress kind of outside of things where, where they do have to deal with that because they're going to get in the working world at some point and have to kind of kind of go through it. Um, how much of this is really a syndrome affecting kind of upper class or upper middle class people compared to other classes of, of income levels? People often wonder that. And they think that, like, the idea of letting your kids do anything independently is just for the upper middle class, which otherwise would be taking them to water polo lessons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was a really interesting study done at uh, Cornell. <laughs> Not that everybody in the study was from Cornell, because that would be the same problem. But it was done at Cornell. Um, and they surveyed, like, over 3,000 parents across every spectrum, race, um, religion, uh, geographic, dis- wherever they were, <laughs> and also income. And what they found is that um, just as this idea of safety has changed from like you're safe enough to walk to school to know you're not, uh, the idea of what's good for kids has gone from give them some independence to always have them in a structured activity. Mm -hmm. And across the economic spectrum, if you had your choice of having your kid just play in the afternoon or putting them in some activity that you have to pay for that actually is expensive and really hard if you're if you're poor but that became the new standard the idea that your kid is going to be better off the more activities you can put them in mm. and i was doing a podcast <laughs> as i am today but the other day i was doing a podcast um with a, a you know just a big panel of people and one of the guys who was african-american from brooklyn said that this is the problem most plaguing 
his community. And by his community, he meant African-Americans in Brooklyn, is that they feel that their kids always have to be in an organized activity. I thought, oh, that's so interesting because yeah. everybody thinks it's just a white upper middle class problem. And here you are saying the opposite. But everybody believes that child uh, times that children are just doing stuff on their own is wasted and probably dangerous for their future. And it would be better if they were in, you know, chess or Kumon or soccer. I have uh, noticed anecdotally a little bit that maybe that maybe things are turning around a little bit. And and actually, I think at least where I live, uh, COVID was was a cause of some of that because you did have this year where kids, those kind of select activities that you had to sign up for were gone. And mm-hmm. I, I remember, so we, we live in a cul-de-sac with a bunch of families. Oh, and yeah, yeah and, it, and it really is like a 1970s neighborhood in general. Like, I mean, I've been amazed that kids kind of do run around. It is kind of the like, just, you know, I guess they can eat at your house or send them home, whatever you want. Yeah. Kids just kind of come back before it gets dark out. And one of the reasons was was during COVID where we had um, one or two families on our, our street where the kids would kind of independently play. And it was like the first two weeks, it was like, all right, you know, we're taking this seriously. Let's kind of keep the kids separate. And then we quickly gave up on that because it was just impossible. And we're like, all right, we're all one big family now. Let the let the kids play outside. They're a pod. From okay. Are you seeing any anything turn around, um, any evidence of that? Um, and we can transition to talking about the public policy angles of that. But Oh, sure. So first of all, you're totally right about the beginning of COVID. The beginning of COVID turned out we did a we did a survey at Let Grow of 1,600 um, parents and 1,600 kids. And once again, across the geographic, economic, racial, religion spectrum. And we asked, uh, maybe this is a slightly leading question, but we asked the kids, are you doing anything new now that you didn't mm-hmm. do before? Have you learned anything just for fun? And oh my God, I mean, given this gift in a way, I mean, not a gift of COVID, but a gift mm-hmm. of free unstructured time, they were you know, playing new games, they were hanging out with their um, siblings more and getting along better because there was sort of no other choice of anybody to play with. Right. Yeah. Uh, they were discovering everything from dinosaurs, origami. One kid, an eight-year-old, got into Bitcoin, which I wish I had gotten into Bitcoin right then and then gotten out. <laughs> gotten out at the right like, time, yeah. Usually that would have been great. I don't know if she did. Um, they were baking and they were doing more chores because they were woven back into the family and the neighborhood. And without somebody else directing their every moment, they had to noodle around and figure out what interest. them. One guy said, I started playing guitar, and the ironic thing is, he was, a, he was like 13, I guess, he said, I have two guitars. You know, my parents always wanted me to play guitar, and they got me guitars, and I hated my guitar lessons. But when I had free time, I just started going on YouTube and learning to play guitar because it was intrinsic rather than extrinsic, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many things that we put our kids in because it, it seems like the right idea. I did it, too. I put baseball and soccer and chess, you name it. Um, But it turns out that when kids have some free time and they're bored and it's not all online, uh, they discover their real interests. And I think that's fantastic for them. And so I really, that's why I preach this idea that kids need some free time. But you also touched on chores. And I feel like that's another thing I missed in my book. It, It seems like not only do kids need some independence and knowing that their parents trust them, uh, but they also need some responsibility so they feel like they're not just prints. They're not just being given stuff, right? They're important for the family itself. I think that means right. a lot. We do it just, it needs to be done. Right. And you're contributing. Um, let's talk about kind of the, so culture is driving a lot of this, but it has public policy effects um, and there's been changes. So a couple of years ago, we we live a couple blocks from our the, the elementary school where, where my kids attend. Um, They have a park there. And I think at the time we had like an eight and a six-year-old and a Mm three-year-old and then a brand new baby. Mm -hmm. And we were going to go to the park and the eight and six-year-old were like, sure, go ahead. You can get a head start. We'll walk down there. Unbeknownst to us, our three-year-old had taken off Uh, trying to follow him. Of course. Could not keep up. Um, So we realized that after a little bit, started heading over to the park. And uh, the eight and six year old were were down playing at the park, and we turn the corner, kind of get on the main stretch. This is in a quiet neighborhood. I, I, um, you have me on the edge of my seat. That's I right. Don't know your story yet. So what happened? And <laughs> I look up ahead, and we turn that corner, and there's a police officer with the police car in the middle of the road, and the three year old is sitting on the sidewalk, crying, um, crying, 
And we get up there and the police officer's very upset. What are you doing? Why is she out here? Like, look, you know, her brother and sister are right there. We can see up to where the park is. She tried to follow them. Such a a normal thing that happens to everybody. Okay, and? And I understand a police officer's driving by and he sees a three-year-old on her own from from his perspective. No, I'd say, good, good, stop. Yeah, but and and he stopped. And but the thing that always uh, stuck with me on this was his. I thought he was going to say, "Look, I know it's kind of a quiet neighborhood, but if she went into the street, she could have gotten hit." Oh, but Who instead knows? he said, but "What if she was kidnapped?" Said, what if she was kidnapped? I know it's Midland, which is a city we live in, which is a safe, safe city. However, things happen, and that always bothered me. It that bothers me so much too because things happen. How, what if she had? stayed in the house and there had been a fire. Right. You know, what which is she, just as likely as a random person. It's, it's way more likely. I mean, yeah. my statistic from my book is that if you wanted your child <laughs> to be kidnapped by a stranger, how long would you have to keep them outside for this to be statistically likely to happen? Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you remember, but the answer is 750,000 years. Wow. It's like how many Powerball tickets would you have to buy? So you can't you can't legislate and you certainly can't arrest people on the basis of something that theoretically, no matter how unlikely, could happen. And yet that's the point we're at. And so and and I have to say that there's a story that yours reminds me of, which is a mom at a picnic in Aurora, Colorado. Um, her three year old wandered off from the picnic. Some other lady found him and she called 911 just as this woman I'm trying to remember her name, Vanessa. Um, was going like, oh, that's my son. She said, no. And and she was calling the police and the police came. And and Vanessa is saying, that's my son. It's like, how do we know it's your son? It's like, that's my son. You got to give him back. And then the other lady is saying, she wasn't supervising him. And so the policeman, um, you know, made a report that, uh, that uh, I don't know what the technical term is, but that meant that Child Protective Services had to go and pay a visit. Mm-hmm. And this is where it gets really horrible. Because a month later, you know, if it was such a terrible mom and this kid was in so much danger, you're going to wait a month. Right. Yeah. A month later, CPS knocks on the door. Vanessa's in the basement, doesn't hear the knock. And so CPS calls the police. Police arrive and three officers enter her home. Guns drawn. They come down in the basement. There she is, terrified. Oh, my God, a house right. invasion. Yeah. Really, what's going on? And she runs upstairs and she calls her mother and her mother comes over and there's chaos in the house. And the grandmother's trying to change the kids into the correct clothes because mm. the police are all mad at her. And and the the mom, Vanessa, is trying to protect her mom from being harassed by the police. And the police say, don't do that. And they tackle her to the floor and they hog tie her mm. uh, with her hands and feet behind her. Uh, and they tie them together. And she said she's carried out like a pig on a stick to the police car. And the only reason we even know this happened was because they dislocated her shoulder and she ended up filing a suit against them with the help of the ACLU. Mm. And that's how it came to light. But the idea that childhood has to be perfect or that parents have to be perfect because if they're not perfect, they're putting their children in horrible danger is the Overton window that we have to shut. Right. Because there's never been a perfect parent. There's never been a perfect childhood and there's never been perfect safety. And to insist on all three of those before we allow parents to breathe or not get arrested or not get investigated for neglect has to change. Yeah. And that's why I'm here today. So my, my favorite economist is a guy named Thomas Sowell, which has a, a, a saying, there's no solutions, only trade-offs. And, and the idea is always right. if you, you say, I want, to, I want to solve an issue, and we always hear politicians say, I want to solve an issue. He, the point from him is you immediately think, what's the trade-off of that? It might be worth it, but there's always a trade-off. And I think one of the trade-offs of this, largely over these these decades, um, is help driving some of this mental instability of kids, where you kind of want to put things in their path and make them overcome things. That's really how you you build up self-esteem and mental stability. Pause. You don't have to put things in their path. You have to get wow. out of their way, and then they go down the path. Right. Allow things. Yeah. To. Yeah. Yeah. A- a- and the other end of this is at at the end of the day, I think for a lot of people, where it's like. All right. So your answer is either parents have to be with their kids 24-7 um, or uh, I guess kids just and a lot of the COVID response to this that I would tell people essentially what we're supposed to do with our kids is they just need to sit inside and play video games all day because that was the result of, of a lot of the public policy decisions. So let's talk about that, uh, what you're trying to actually change here. I grew up like you in Illinois. Um, I believe it's the most stringent state 
for babysitting rules. It was. I, or it was for it's a while. It's law. And, uh, and w- so what was that? How does it change? What are the other policy things that you like to change? So um, right now in most states, the neglect laws are broad and sort of um, ambiguous. They say things like, the parent must provide proper supervision. Well, mm-hmm. like I think you were providing proper supervision the other day when your kids were going to the park. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet things are imperfect. And here I have to pause and say that at one point, the prime minister of England was at a pub with his wife and his child. And then, you know, lunch was over and he went off with the Secret Service or whatever they're called in England. And she went off in her car, at which point their daughter emerged from the bathroom and said, where are right. my parents? Yep. So you don't have to be a bad parent to suddenly lose track of your kids. Have a mistake. Right. It's so normal. So the laws don't, um, the laws allow a lot of discretion on the part of uh, the authorities to say, well, I wouldn't do it that way, or that's too young, or Mm -hmm. you should have been with your child. And right now we're trying to make the law narrower. And so that neglect is when you blatantly disregard obvious and serious danger. Mm -hmm. You know, you did it deliberately. You just said, I don't care if my three-year-old's out in the middle of the highway at 3 a.m. That's fine by me. That's neglect. It's 110 degrees and you're leaving the kid in the car. Yes. So so blatant disregard for obvious danger should be the standard that kicks in a neglect investigation, as opposed to simply trusting your kid with some independence because you want to, as we were talking about before, you think it's great for them to get fresh air, play in the park, walk to school. Or because you have to, because you cannot afford constant child care when you think that your child is ready for some independence. Mm. So the law now says that blatant, dis- the law that we're trying to change and that we changed in Illinois, says blatant disregard is the, um, is the basis for neglect, not simply whatever improper supervision is. Mm-hmm. Um, so what states have you been working in? Where, where, where are you seeing this type of success? So many. It started in Utah. Uh, Utah passed the first, it used to be called the Free Range Parenting Law. Yeah. They passed theirs. On that point, a lot of, like, where or I live, a lot of the, the people in the neighborhoods are Mormons, and they all seem to be fairly free range. I wonder if there's a cultural I thing think there. there but I, I'll tell you why I think that makes some sense. Um, one is larger families. Obviously, if you have more than two mm-hmm. kids, you can't have one parent with each kid in every single second. Right, in right. Single. I think we've all seen parents with the first kid versus the second, yeah, third. Yeah, certainly it, uh, versus yeah. the fifth, yes. And um, and also, a, a lot of times, Mormon kids, when they're 18, go off to another country, mm. right? I saw the Book of Mormon. They go off to another right. country. Yeah. And that means that you want to be preparing your child to be really independent and land on their feet in another culture, in another language, knocking on strangers' doors, trying to talk to people that they don't know and, and don't have a lot in common with. And so if that is what you know is coming... I think you're more aware that, like, I better give my kids some freedom now so that they're not thrown for a loop um, should they become a missionary. So that's one of my... And, and I also think faith has a, has a big role yep. in um, whether you can let go of your kids or not. And the way I explain it is that um, when I was five, my mom let me go around the corner and, and walk to kindergarten. And it wasn't that she was not a nervous mom or anything or didn't care if I lived or died. It's just that that's what you did back then. And it built your trust muscle because you couldn't follow the kid. You didn't walk the kid there and you certainly didn't have a GPS system. So every day she got experience in trusting me, my neighborhood, maybe God, maybe the odds, maybe fate, but something besides her being in control of me until 330 when I came home. Mm. And I think as we've lost, um, as we've sort of lost the need for that kind of faith, whether it's in God or our neighborhood or our kids or all three, uh, we've started to think it's all on us. And that's what I was talking about, this idea of control. And when you think that you're in control and not something larger than you, you feel like you have to micromanage. And that's where we're at. Well, uh, we... Wait, wait, I didn't tell you the states. So Utah, Utah was the first. You know, good for them. And then along came um, Oklahoma and Texas. And then it looked like, oh, is this a red state issue? But then along came Colorado. And then came Connecticut, Virginia, Mm -hmm. where people don't get along that well on the left and right, passed unanimously, Connecticut and Montana. Mm -hmm. And what's great about that is in many of the states, we've had bipartisan sponsors, as we do here in Michigan. And in many states, it passed unanimously, including 
Utah, okay, red state, Connecticut, blue state, Virginia, whatever the hell that right, is. Right, yeah, back and, and forth. Right, and Colorado as well. So it's clearly not a partisan issue. It's mm-hmm. just an issue of people realizing, like, the government shouldn't be involved in family decisions unless those decisions are egregious and really putting a child in danger. Well, Lenore, we thank you for for joining us today. You're 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 doing the work on this, which is changing the societal part of things, doing your best to kind of turn that around, which ultimately leads to better public policy. Um, so, thank you for doing your part to shift the Overton window. Thank you. Up it goes. <laughs>